Welcome to Brave. Be inspired by the best leaders of Southeast Asia tech. Build the future, learn from our past, and stay human in between. I'm Jeremy Ao, a VC, founder, and father. Join us for transcripts, analysis, and community at www.jeremyao.com. Hey, Katie, good to have you on the show. Yes, nice to meet you. Thank you so much for um, agreeing to chat about On Deck. Yeah, uh, super excited because uh, you are Ching Ching's cousin, which was my Harvard <laughs> MBA classmate. We had a lot of fun together. Uh, and any friend of hers, or I guess any relative of hers is a friend of mine. <laughs> yeah, so look, what's up? What's on your mind? Um, so I am applying to On Deck and I'm just kind of, you know, trying to decide if it's a if it's a good use of time and whether it's a good way to you know um you know find a co- basically find co-workers uh, not co-workers but co-founders and also decide if it's like a good path to take as a, a potential founder of a startup and you had mentioned that you had uh, recently gone through the the founder fellowship um, and so i'm just very curious about you know uh, what was it like during your time during ODF uh, six, I believe, correct? Um, and then also, you know, whether you thought that was a good experience and a good use of your time. Yeah, awesome. Happy to share a little bit about it. So, you know, overall, I think On Deck is great. I think it's a great program that has, uh, you know, strong community, strong set of experiences, uh, and I think the format is very accessible because so much of it's asynchronous. Is very, very much school and, uh, you know, course that is built for the internet and built for like, I think the modern working professional, uh, I say all these things at a couple of different levels, right. In terms of personal experience, uh, the first of course is going through the on deck founder fellowship, uh, ODF seven. And then I later on went into, uh, ODP on deck podcaster one. And then after that, I actually ended up angel investing into on deck as well. Uh, because I was so impressed by the program. Obviously, you know, not everything is like roses. Uh, so obviously going to dive into it. But, you know, overall, at a high level, uh, highly positive. Uh, but I think there are better ways to do the program and there are worse ways to do the program uh, based on what you're thinking. How did you hear about the program and, you know, how did you end up applying? Yeah, I think I must have, you know, it's a great question because I think I ran across it because someone else did it and you know they put it on their linkedin and so i was very much like what is this program and i checked it out and um i think what appealed to me when i saw the page was that i think it was a way to build an online community in a covid world at that time uh with other founders and i think the people i respected were part of that program as well uh and so it was very much curiosity that led me to reach out and see what's going on and then as i saw you know who else was out there in terms of alumni and everything i saw that it was an opportunity to build a community obviously virtually uh but also geographically right because you know i spent so many years in the states as an undergrad and as a mba student and as a founder and then now i'm in singapore but it was a great way to like you know extend my community and hang out right (laughs) with other folks uh, who are entrepreneurial so i think i was very much looking forward to the curation part of it and I ended up reaching out to someone else uh, who did a program. I sat down with him in Singapore uh, and we discussed the pros and cons of, you know, some of it, which I'm talking about now, and also some of the cons so in terms of the geographic time zones and how to make the most of the program. And then turns out that he was also meeting another on deck person right after that. Um, so the first person is Jeffrey C. So he uh, co-founded Chosen Exchange, which is, uh, you know, the first program to teach entrepreneurship in North Korea, uh, which is, uh, you know, and he's a Bainey and he's a friend of mine. And he's, uh, he's the husband also of another good friend of mine, Van, who's another Harvard MBA. So, so he, you know, he's a great guy. He's been on my podcast. So feel free to check out, you know, uh, his podcast episode, which will link to the show notes um, for his episode. And then after that, he, you know, we were eating food and then, he was like, hey, actually, I'm meeting a, another on deck person after this. And so we ended up hanging out with Spencer Yang after that for a quick, you know, five, 10 minutes. Uh, and, you know, he's just an awesome product leader in crypto um, and 
very much very smart, very sharp. And, you know, we just had a good five, 10 minute conversation. And after I walked out of that meeting with, you know, between the three of us, uh, I think I very much felt like, okay, this is something that I can see the value in if I can have this nice you know, community of three people in Singapore. Of course, it turns out that the community in Singapore is not much larger than these three people. Uh, so maybe I was a little bit suckered by that and because I joined and now became four or five, right? Uh, but I, that was a, I think that was a good indicator of the community that's there, the caliber um, in terms of who they're screening. So I think that's um, what's special about the ODF program. Um, yeah, and I'm happy to talk to you more about what the actual program is. But, you know, that's pretty much the process of how I ended up seeing, you know, researching and eventually closing on uh, doing the on-deck experience. The program was started during the pandemic, right? So it's been virtual since the first cohort. Yeah, I think it's, I think they only started taking off actually effectively by going remote. So before that, it had been a mixture of in-person and remote. And I think it was growing, but wasn't necessarily really a rocket ship. And I think by going global or remote, I think it opened up a ton of people who just would not have accessed it the way that they were initially designing it. So I think it's a you know classic example of a startup that found its legs during the pandemic versus you know other startups who did not. What do you think are the pros and cons of it being so global and just remote? I think the, the pros of it, of course, is that because you're remote, it makes it much easier in terms of geography, right? Um, and that's important because not everybody is in SF. That's one way to think about it. So you, know, you can be in LA, you can be, you know, in the suburbs, right? You know, you could be so many different places. You could be in Denver or you could be in Singapore like me, right? <laughs> you know, um, so I think that global side actually allows anybody to access that, which is great uh, in terms of that. And... I think even within the Bay Area, uh, even if this was a program, it's just so much easier to fit into your daily life, right? If it's remote, because now you can join some of the sessions while you're, <laughs> you know, at work, right? You know, or at a gym or commuting. Like there are ways for you to really kind of like be part of that community in a way that is more complementary rather than you know taking away from something else uh, in your life. I think also it allows for better. Um, frankly, selectivity um, and therefore quality because now you can draw from a global pool of candidates to join a program. And so that allows you to keep your selectivity rate high, which is a proxy for quality, right? And so that keeps the pool good and tight for the community so that everybody feels like there's a you know, marker of trust, right? Where everybody is of the, a range of caliber uh, that you're happy to be part of, right? And of course, because everyone's global and everyone's high quality and everybody's, is, I think it allows for asynchronous communication and sessions. And that's really important because I think there are lots of people don't necessarily learn by, you know, simultaneously Zoom. But I think there's lots of different ways. Like, you know, I tend to batch my time. So, you know, I spend one or two hours just reading everything in one go, uh, researching in one go, listening to, you know, or reading the transcripts in one go, uh, which is much more important to me in terms of how I process information uh, versus like the traditional, you know, I think a lot of the schools right now are very much like, okay, we all have to sit in a lecture for one hour together, right? Uh, which is a little bit of a nightmare uh, for someone like me. So um, yeah, that's the pros. Obviously the cons, you know, it's nice to hang out in person with people, you know, get me wrong. Uh, you know, it's just nice to like, I don't know, buddy, buddy, or, you know, hang out. Or, you know, there's more presence, obviously, that, hang, that happens. Uh, and I think, obviously, the geographic aspect helps because um, you want some of that, you know, local affiliation or uh, camaraderie that happens. Uh, but I think, you know, On Deck has done a pretty good job in like iterating to be like, how do we, you know, say like the content is asynchronous. Um, we encourage people to do a lot of one-on-one -on -one calls and to build a community and camaraderie. They have like group icebreakers to make it have that affiliation. And of course, they encourage local meetups, uh, you know, whenever it's safe, right, based on your country. So I think those are all good things. And I think it comes out to be a stronger product, right? Because what it shows is I think you'll see a lot more like startups that are like distributed or remote in terms of their approach, Um and I think it's still, and then you'll see com 
companies that are a little bit more like, you know, tackling international problems or at least regional problems as well. So I think there's a lot of like hidden perks and um, that that fits for me, right? And I think for a lot of professionals like me. Were a lot of the um, teams that you saw have like founders from different locations um, or yeah. was that still not common? And do you think founding teams can actually be fully remote? Do you think that works well? Yeah, it's a solid question. So within OnDeck, definitely saw a lot of remote or distributed teams, which is not just a function of OnDeck, but also a function of the pandemic, right? You know, even if you're like in the same city, you're not going to hang out with someone else. Um, so most people are working remotely anyway. But I think OnDeck, because everybody is kind of a like global distributed, asynchronous, uh, there is self-selected, right? You know, the people who really, really wanted something to be in person, <laughs> uh, really, really wanted to be in the same city tackling that city's problems. I think a lot of those folks are not part of the program per se, right? Um, that being said, of course, everybody's kind of like looking forward to hanging out with each other once the pandemic is over and get to meet each other, right? And whenever we cross paths in the city or something, or, uh, or if you're in the same team in the same place to we'll work together in person as well. So uh, it, it just means that I think everybody as part of the program is what I call like digitally fluent and, you know, work from home fluent, right? <laughs> you know, and that helps a lot because then as a result, the high proportion of teams are all asynchronous, remote, you know, very like flexible. We're talking about the problems that tackling, of course, it, it ranges, right? I think obviously, you know, if you are in SF and you're partnering with someone in Denver, right, you know, is a chance to collaborate because you both have expertise or you both have a strong fit and want to found at the same time. So I think that's one of the strengths that OnDeck has compared to a lot of different programs like Entrepreneur First or Antla in, the, in Southeast Asia uh, or globally, actually, because for Entrepreneur First and Antla, the way they define it is we're looking for obviously great folks, but they all have to be in the same city, right, at the same time. So similar to a lot of like traditional accelerated programs or incubator programs. Um, and obviously those are great, but obviously it means that because you're optimizing to some extent the fact that you are in the same geography at the same time, it reduces your ability to match people based on their skills or their interests, right? Or their industries, uh, which is a different set of pool maximization from a curation perspective, right? Then you want to, you know, kind of like squeeze them in and then let them like, you know, find each other and have that serendipity, right? So yeah, I think that's the fun part, right? And I think because of that, I think OnDeck also from day one lets you kind of like, so entrepreneur first, because they're trying to maximize the geographic pieces like or Antler, you only can really co-found with your batch of like 30 to 50 folks at that time, right? And if you don't match, you know, you're out of luck in that sense. But OnDeck is almost the opposite where orthogonal, where you're like, you come in and you can meet, you know, you know, 500 to 1,000 other folks at the same time. Some have already formed their own startup. Some are still looking from previous batches. And some are still looking within the current cohort, right? But because they're not limited by geography they're, and they're all digitally fluent, again, you know, there's a more interesting set of options that you have. So I'm not saying you should only do on deck. I'm just saying that I think if you can do a physical incubator, that's a way to do it. And you can also do this on deck as well. So um, it's just different maximizing for different things. Um, yeah. Yeah, on deck is unique because you can go in without an idea. So there's it's a it's a unique mix of people who may have already had something concrete and then some people who are still searching. Did you go into the program right. knowing that what you wanted to do, or did you go in, you know, potentially being open to something, you know, something that may interest you? Yeah, that's a growing trend of uh, places and incubators that allow people to walk in with really no idea or barely a hint of an idea. So I think we see that at venture studios where they're looking for founders who don't have an idea but willing to execute. I think you see that at programs with like Entrepreneur First and Antler and On Deck, which are very much looking for a certain caliber of people who are founder types and are willing to take on that, you know, portfolio approach and it's, you know, put them in a room virtually or in person and then see what happens from there, right? And then put select or nurture the winners, right? Um, so I think what's a little bit unique is that I think for entrepreneurs as an antler, you know, they pay for your stipend, you know, they pay you a couple grand per month for the period of the program. And then you have to be full time as part of that dynamic. And then those that win 
are allowed to get an investment, you know, to kickstart the program in that sense. So these are like venture studios, right? You know, similar to that, where they're looking for that founding team and then invest in them to hopefully take off. Whereas I think Onda is the opposite, right? Where these people are paying, putting money in um, to be part of the program, right? And so there's some later downstream investment opportunities via the Ondeck Angels and Ondeck VC dynamic that happens uh, for sure. But, you know, I think that the crux of it is still that you're paying a subscription fee to join the program. And so I think that changes the incentives a little bit differently, right? Because one is, you know, like we want you to be full-time and we're trying to maximize winners within this portfolio, which is, I think, great um, because a lot of people get a shot to work full-time on an idea that they have or they hope to have or collaborate with and don't have the downside risk of the salary in that sense. But I think for on deck, it's a little bit more interesting where you pay the money, but you, there's no expectation for you to be full-time, right? You can be part-time or, you know, weekends, right? Um, and that really helps a lot because I think that really changes the dynamic uh, for a ton of folks um, that couldn't access a program like that before. Were you full-time or part-time? And would you recommend someone to go f- full-time to completely, you know, get maximum benefit out of this program? I think for on deck, I would recommend part time. Um, and I wouldn't say it's because of on deck, but it's because why I normally recommend most founders to, or people who want to be founders to do. Um, I think one of the things that, you know, someone had asked me before was like, you know, what's the most common mistake that founders, first time founders have? And I always tell people, I was like, the one I really see a lot is that I think there's a big belief that you have to be full time to be a founder or at least to get things started. And I think it's a problem because I think there's a lot of founder pornography where it seems like on the, you know, Forbes or Fortune that, you know, these people quit full time and, you know, the idea launch, et cetera. But actually, I think it turns out to be a lot more messier once you kind of actually look at the actual reality of it, which is that they probably had an idea, they were nurturing the idea for quite a while, you know, they're testing different iterations. And then as they got customers and so, so forth, they finally got the signals, if that makes sense that it made sense and they also had enough savings to do so. I mean, you know, it's, there's a lot more like overlap and it doesn't fit well in a, you know, 300 word article. Right. And so we kind of celebrate a part where they go full time or the fundraise, but I don't think it's really the crux of what it means to be a founder. Right. I think the crux of being a founder is that there's a problem that you care about and is valuable to solve. And then you build a solution there and then you get customers to try that solution. I love it, right? Um, and they love it enough to pay you money and then they pay you in a way in the money that makes sense to continue solving the problem, right? When you scale that out, right? Mm-hmm. And all those are the fundamental sides of building a business and nowhere does it say go full time, right? You know, like if you can do that while you're doing a part-time job, why not, right? You know, um, yeah. if you can do that while you're, doing a full-time job and you're doing this on the weekends or, you know, the evening hours, why not? Right. You know, um, you know, I, I really kind of like feel like people has, have this false dilemma, which is I want to be a founder and I have to go full-time. I, I, I don't see that as really linked together, which is, I think you can be a founder and I have to be disciplined about being a founder, which is true, <laughs> but it doesn't mean that you have to go full-time. And I think some of the horror stories that I've seen from my perspective is from people who become founders is that at the end of the day, when you think about those steps, right, which I talked about, which is finding a problem, crafting the solution, getting customers, uh, you know, starting to make sure you collect money and, you know, feed the system and build people. I think we tend to have this overly simplistic view of that process as almost like a linear thing, <laughs> but it's actually kind of recursive, right? Because an iterative in the sense that you keep looping back if you fail at a certain stage, you know, like what if your problem is wrong or you actually don't care about a problem or the solution is not that attractive, right? And or people don't want to pay for it even if they do find it valuable, right? And so I think everybody's brains would be like, oh, it takes it will take me six months to get from zero all the way to figuring this out to raising a seed fund. And and because I saw on the news that it took six months, right? You know, whatever it was. And so they, they budget out six months of savings, right? But the problem then as a result is like, that's true if you get everything right. right? Yeah. But what if it takes longer, right? You know, um, what if it takes one year, sometimes it takes two years to find something that you really love to solve. Um, and then the problem is that you quit your job, you're full time, you're at 
home by yourself <laughs> to some extent. You're not you're no longer in the intellectual environment of your workplace, you know, inspiration from colleagues, etc. And then you have six months of savings, but the problem then is the truth is you're actually only going to work on your idea for three months. Um, because the truth is once you hit the three months mark and you only have three months of savings left, you realize that you need to go back to work and you know it takes three months to find a job. So suddenly you've been working full time for three months, you're very happy. And then you're like, oh shit, I don't know what's going on. Or is something's going bad. And then you're like, oh no, I have three months of savings left. So I better start interviewing for a job. And the moment you start interviewing for a job, it creates a weird reality where you're working your ass off to build this idea. But at the same point in time, <laughs> you are working on building a path to get out of that process, right? Mm -hmm. And that mentality shift just changes everything. Because then your last three months becomes, I'm working hard to fight into this job. And I'm working hard to build a startup and I, the cognitive dissonance is very strong. So I think overall, my recommendation is if you know there's a problem, you know, try to do it as a side hustle, right? You know, as a hobby, whatever it is, right? You know, <laughs> sorry, it's a hobby to your boss, it's a hobby to, to your colleagues, right? In that sense, or a side hustle, but you know, just slowly build it out and get to the point where, you know, you get that, that conviction, right? So a lot of people think about founders as being like this high risk gamble. And I think the truth is, if you actually look at the stories, the most founding stories, like you know, look at, you read the autobiographies of Shrew Dog, you read the autobiographies of like, you know, S Steve Jobs. Like if you actually look at how long it took for them to build that prototype on the side, you know, you know, Steve Jobs and Wall Street were in the garage, right? <laughs> you know, like, you know, they were just working on it on the side, right? And then, and then they got at a point where they felt conviction to do it. To, so to them, the founder, it's a very low risk decision mm -hmm. to go full time. And to the world, it seems like a very high risk decision because they don't understand the problem. They don't understand the customers. They don't understand the solution. Right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So I think that's what I kind of like really caution. Therefore, at the end of the day is um, I think when you want to found something, really just make sure that you start understanding the problem, getting customers, crafting a solution on the side <laughs> on the weekends. That's it, you know? And then as you get more conviction, you carve out more and more time, right? Is there a timing of when, what is the timing that you think that someone should decide whether they want to go full-time or not? Is there a secret recipe to that? Or do you think that's really up to the, you know, the founder in the current situation? Yeah, I think my benchmark I tell people is when your company that you're founding pays you enough to eat ramen, right? That's a perfect time <laughs> to head out. Not head out, but that's when you should, you really shouldn't do it earlier. <laughs> but that's tough. It's actually a really hard bar if you think about it, right? Because let's just say your rent is like, you know, and your living expenses, let's just say all in, it could be like, you know, three to five grand a month, right? I'm just saying like, just as bare minimum, right? Yep. But you know, it's not just revenue, right? It's profit, right? Um, but actually... In the grand scheme of things, I'll tell you, it's like, it's really easy to do, um, to get there mm -hmm. versus like building the whole startup. So when you zoom out as a very experienced founder, like getting a company to three to five grand in profit is a very small and easy target to go to. But I think as a first time founder, I think it's the opposite, which is getting to three grand to five grand profit feels like a very far away goal. Um, but the truth is, I think if you have a discipline about it, you know, you're carving out 10 to 20 hours a week towards it you know, people will get there, um, you know, just being very disciplined. And I think it sharpens the mind a lot for different folks. A lot of folks are like, oh, what's the secret sauce? Is it because I feel it's good? Is it when the VC tells me it's a good idea? Is it because, you know, when I'm on the press? And I'm like, no, no, no. It's like your job feeds you right now. <laughs> lets you stay in a rent. It lets you have a laptop. It lets you pay for utilities. And those are all the things that you need in order to be able to work on your startup, right? Yep. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, and there's no way you're going to be happy moving out into a smaller place, uh, you know, with no food, with no water, with no Wi-Fi. <laughs> you know, you're not going to be happy and you're not going to be able to do your best work, right? So I think if you just carve it out and just be like, I will build this company until it's three to five grand, or whatever your, your living wage requirements are, mm -hmm. um, I think that's what most people should aim towards because it focuses the mind, but also is a really clear threshold. Oh, uh, one last thing is that, of course, it's like once you get a couple grand of profit as well per month uh, and you start paying yourself for that, it's actually also roughly about a time that when angels and seed VCs are 
basically start getting interested, right? Because now you've also proven out that not only is your product valuable to certain folks, but it's valuable enough to generate a profit, right? Um, and then you're also self-sustainable as well in the short term. And so that's also a really interesting time that people can start fundraising um, as well. Mm -hmm. Do you think that comment is different whether the startup is in software or in hardware? Because hardware is may have higher R&D costs, harder to turn a profit. Yeah, that's a fair point. Yeah, I think it's a fair point. Um, you know, I think that for a lot of hardware, yeah, you know, sometimes it's just, I mean, some hardware is impossible, right? I don't know, quantum computing, right? It's going to be, <laughs> you're going to raise a lot, quite a bit of cash. But at the same point of time, if you're doing hardware, then you also know that it's going to take way longer than six months yeah. <laughs> uh, without a salary to get it out the door as well, right? So it even more pushes you to, um, you know, reevaluate what the exact trajectory that you want to do is. So in either software or hardware, my big push is just like, how do you de-risk that personally as much as possible? Uh, you know, because, you know, yeah, you know, more time doesn't mean higher velocity. Yeah. You know what I mean? You know, and I think that's what a lot of people realize. Yeah. Okay. How would you maximize on deck? Are there, is there any specific, you know, unique parts about the program that you maybe the listeners may be kind of interested in hearing about? Maybe some fun stories? <laughs> I think there are three parts to the on deck experience from a consumption perspective. Uh, I think the first part, obviously, is the content that feels like the most obvious to the speakers and so, so forth. And I think the second is really about the community events, so like mixers and stuff like that. And then the third is really the one-on-one -on -one conversations. And I'll say the fourth is maybe some of the asynchronous communications for messaging. I would say personally for myself, I found uh, as an experienced founder, I found the content side a little less interesting, uh, primarily because I think I already done so much of it. <laughs> so uh, I was very much like, uh, you know, not didn't find a lot of it relevant, or at least I felt like I already covered it before. But at the same point of time, you know, with my cynical jaded eyes, I also understand that it can be actually very new and thoughtful for people who haven't seen it before, right? And I think there was a really a refreshing, authentic tone to it which is quite nice because, you know, it feels like a straightforward conversation. So I think personally, I think it's not as efficient as reading an article on doing something, <laughs> but you know, reading, reading and listening to something um, is, I think, a good modality for a lot of people to learn. Uh, but I think there's less for me. Um, but And I could never catch them live because in, I was in Singapore as a time zone. But I definitely did enjoy it, like, and I really preferred really listening to them asynchronously because um, they record everything, which is awesome. And then actually listening to them at 2x speed. <laughs> <laughs> so, which is, you know, because I'm much more efficient, right? Because I'm just trying to get the content out. I'm not, you know, and so I felt like that's a, that's my tip for you is just like for a lot of folks is just going to be like, do you need to listen to it live? Because you're, you're that kind of person who needs to listen to something live with a community or is it something that you're willing to listen to on 2x speed separately, right? <laughs> so I think that's one. Um, and then I think the second part is the community mixes, which I think are really awesome. And I think people should do as much of them as possible. Uh, primarily because it's a fast way to meet everybody as fast as possible in like five to 10 minutes. And the truth is because it's a function of two things, right? The first part is just like, you don't have a lot of time, right? You know, you're doing this part-time or on the weekends, whatever. You don't have time. So you know, you want to meet as many people efficiently as possible so that you have the opportunity to collaborate and do something awesome. Uh, but also I think it maximizes serendipity as well because then you might meet someone and, you know, chat about an idea that you never thought you'd tackle or you meet someone who I think if you did a targeted outreach search for, you wouldn't have targeted because there was just a different persona um, in terms of skill sets. But actually when you hang out with them, you actually resonate and really click with them, right? Uh, so that's a really <laughs> awesome feeling to have. And I think it's really possible in the, the mixes. Uh, I think the third thing is really the one-on-ones. Um, it's really about a targeted outreach, which is sit down, you know, go through the membership directory and just like, you know, based on your own personal interests and everything, just do as many one-on-one -on -one calls, 30 minutes. I think it's more than enough to kick things off. Don't try to do one hour. Because I think a lot of people start off with one hour and it's just like, yeah, you know, like, you're not saying that you won't have a conversation with them again, but... <laughs> You know, can we just kick it off for like 30 minutes, right? Um, and I think that's really important for a ton of folks just to like get to know each other. And then, and I really push people to and advise people to be 
very thorough on that list. Like go through the whole list and just, just ask that invite for everybody. And everybody's happy to chat. They'll be scared because everybody's there to start a business, right? So everyone's very happy to chat. It's kind of like freshman, you know, kind of like first 90 days, right? You know, everybody's very you know, happy and, you know, ready to mingle, right? You know, single and ready to mingle. So uh, that's a perfect time to just really get aggressive about, you know, uh, hitting up everybody. Um, I think the last thing is really about the chat messages. Uh, I think that's pretty underweighted. I think there's a lot of random knowledge um, in the Slack because it's like kind of like archaeology, I guess, because there's like so many batches before. Uh, so people are discussing and I always tell people is like, you know, being a founder, being now being a VC or now, you know, being someone who helps other founders as well, you know, think through IDA or help with their branding or marketing is like, it's like sometimes it feels a bit like being a professor watching like seven classes a freshman go through and you're just watching them all go through the same stuff over and over again, right? Which is like the same questions over and over again, the same problems, the same dynamics. Um, now the answers may be different, I think each time around and obviously ends up being individually different, but there's so much like knowledge in the peer to peer side. And so I think there've been a ton of times where I've gone into Slack and as if you like, I'll give you an example was like, I was part of basically we have people who want to sponsor the podcast now, right? And so I didn't care about that topic, you know, months ago and I wasn't paying attention or talking about it with people one one or in mixes, right? That wasn't a problem I had. So I just typed in like, you know, sponsor. And then, yeah, you know, there's a bunch of people discussing it, um, you know, three to four months ago, right? And then I just added my thoughts to the thread and say, hey, thanks for this. And here's my take on the problem. And, and then I use those resources to build up my own, you know, set of documents. And then soon I'll be, you know, dropping my document into that group, right? Because I know that in three months, six months, one year, two years, five years, there'll be a bunch of folks who are going to ask the same question, <laughs> right? Which is how do you, you know, talk to sponsors, right? And then and what materials do you have for them? And, you know, it's the same thing, right? So, you know, I think I'm sharing that from personal basis, from a consumption, but also from a community and production angle, right? So I think that's something that's really underrated. It's like searching through the Slack. Um, so yeah, it's basically a giant forum, right? You know? <laughs> yeah. Are all cohorts in the Slack or is it just your current cohorts? Or do you have like the wealth of knowledge from like past cohorts? <laughs> it's a mixture of both. I think they have an interesting signal and noise dynamic because um, long story short is you have two sites. One is stuff that's only for your cohort and then your stuff that's shared by everybody in on deck founder and i think there's a sort of maybe a few channels that shared across all on deck oh, cohort wow. types <laughs> um and so i honestly had to mute a ton of channels i have <laughs> muted 90 percent of the channels out there so I, I didn't join every channel and after all the channels i joined i muted 90 percent oh wow and because i was just getting bombarded with notifications so i think the way i consume now is you know, on the weekends, I carved out several hours and I go into Slack and I start reading, even though I'm muted in channels, I go to them and I read them in a, in a row, right? You know, it's kind of like, you know, reading the forums in one go, right? Um, <laughs> rather than getting notified with every notification. Yep. And also, I think when you let, when you have, you know, some channels I have not seen for a month, right? Or two months or three months, but at least when I go to it, it feels like someone else was having a conversation. <laughs> and then now when I'm following along, I'm not... It, it makes more logical sense seeing that as an arc or thread of conversations, right? Rather than, you know, watching each one come by, right? Yeah. Um, but sometimes I'm the person who's doing that participation with someone else and discussing with someone else, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, that's been an interesting uh, dynamic uh, for that. Um, so I think there's also some interesting collaborations, obviously, that people are trying to do now as well. Um, because I think they're working hard to connect pieces to the different pieces. So, for example, the On Deck podcasters um, is quite different from writing, obviously, as a practice, but actually it's quite similar in terms of a production angle, right? Um, so they've actually created these threads uh, where, you know, we can hang out, this mixes so that we can hang out across um, categories in that sense. Uh, and then we also have a channel uh, where uh, I think there's a bunch of founders who want to be featured on podcasts. Uh, so that's a cool collaboration, right? Because founders need press releases, people to show some profiling or some belief uh, to help them with their content marketing and then guests, sorry, podcast hosts need more, you know, profile people to profile. 
So there's another cool kind of like collaboration as well. Um, a little bit less relevant for me because mine is about Southeast Asians uh, in tech. So again, because of that geographic aspect of it. But I've met a few uh, great founders that I've interviewed through um, on deck, right? So uh, Stephen Tennyson, uh, you know, he was part of the on deck program. Him there, he's Indonesian and, you know, setting up a startup. He was on my podcast, which I'll link separately. Uh, Albert Lier from Zendit as well, also off to potentially found something, uh, also on a podcast. And I think I also did uh, Jasmine Wang as well. She's in the States, but I think she had a very interesting angle on AI copywriting. And so I very much like took the chance to chat with her, even though she wasn't necessarily, you know, tech in Southeast Asia, but it was just an interesting angle. So yeah, so lots of random serendipity moments that happen, right, uh, through the program. I'm also really curious, like, is there an end goal to the program, similar to you know, like some incubator programs, they have like a presentation day, right? So you have something to to work towards. Does On Deck also have that, or? Yeah, On Deck does have that as well, um, and I think they do do a good job, kind of like hyping up the community to join in. It's not mandatory, which is uh, it's more of an optional thing uh, or recommended. Um, mm-hmm. So I think it's a great experience for lots of folks. Um, so. And I think people just hang out. I think a lot of people also take the opportunity to build in public uh, as well. So they're kind of like releasing not just the demo day, but also share asynchronously over Slack and say like, oh, I did this, I did that, you know, or I'm struggling with this, or I'm happy about that. Um, and so I think it's a little bit of nice like community helping each other kind of dynamic that's really nice um, and very asynchronous. So it's kind of interesting. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a ton of fun. I really recommend it for a lot of folks. But, you know, it's different, right? It's 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 again it's i think if you join full time and you went to on deck i think it's still good uh but i think where it really shines at is if you're part time and you're doing the program i think you have just as good an experience right yeah which is very different from most incubators and accelerators right which is that you have to be full time you have to be and, there, and therefore we can all assure that we're all going to have a demo day we're all full time there we all have to be there <laughs> um you know <laughs> it's very different right you know? yeah yeah um Aside from ODF and ODP, are there any other on deck programs that you'd be interested in trying out? Yeah, you know, actually, the interesting thing is I've also angel invested not just in on deck, but also um, in one other on deck startup, uh, which is called uh, Presently via uh, so Dalia Katan. She's awesome. Uh, so I joined the program and I think she saw my profile somehow on on deck and she was like, I think it's cool. Would you like to angel invest? And I wasn't even angel investing uh, seriously at that point in time. <laughs> And then she Twitter DM me, which I never checked Twitter and I never checked DMs, you know, because <laughs> no one has ever DM me on Twitter. That's like, I mean, there's a lot of people DMing, but you know, like, but she wrote a, like a nice message and everything. And I was like, okay, fine. I have to chat. I talked to her and I was like, got excited about the startup and I was like, okay, fine. I'll angel invest. Right. Uh, you know, which was a, a surprise to me and kind of like kicked off my angel investing journey actually. And I think she's kind of like knocked out of the park since then. Right. Uh, because of you know, the fact that she's, you know, clear about what she's doing, I think is a problem. She's taking like the decentralization and virtualization of gifting um, in, you know, corporate and friendship circles, which I think makes a lot of sense because I face that problem in my company and as a human being who has to do group gifting, right? Uh, and so she's coming on the podcast sometimes so we can talk about this as well, about why you know, I invested in her and I don't know how she discovered me, I guess, from her perspective and what she likes about our uh, working relationship so far. Um, and, you know, the crazy part is that she's in LA, right? You know, and her team is distributed across the States and she would DM me. I don't even, <laughs> she didn't even know that I was in Singapore. And then she just DM me and then I was like, okay, cool, you know. Uh, so it worked out for everybody, right? Uh, I'm happy about it. She's happy about it. You know, I refer customers to her. She's been a helpful reference to uh, you know, other folks in my network. So I think uh, as a result, I do kind of like maybe think to myself maybe about the On Deck Angel Fellowship. I do think about it a little bit. But then in my brain, I'm kind of like, <laughs> you know, I'm already part of two On Deck communities. So I really want to add, you know, the angel thing as well. Um, obviously, I'm a VC now. So On Deck VC as well might be a nice way to build out a network in the VC side. So those are kind of like the things I do think about. Yeah, in terms of the programs, so. Are there any other maybe programs that you think people should consider if, you know, while they're applying to On Deck, is there any other great programs that they can maybe look into that you may know off the top of your head? 
I know you mentioned two, but um, I don't know if those were based in Southeast Asia. I think everybody wants to be a founder, but it may not necessarily be the stage that they're actually kind of going into. So I think they have some good, interesting programs like, you know, on deck climate tech, on deck chief of staff. Um, and I think those tighter programs are actually pretty interesting from my perspective because I think the more niche the industry is, the more valuable it is on a global basis to source from everybody in the world, right? Um, that's, 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 that's my point of view. I don't know if it's actually true, uh, but I guess it's kind of, I guess I mean, I'm asking, because I think founder is a pretty generic phrase, right? If that makes sense. So it's like, you can found in any country, you get, which is not a problem, but you can found in any problem, in any vertical, you know, it's actually a pretty broad phrase actually. And, um, but I think on that podcaster was actually a pretty interesting dynamic where it's a much tighter group, right? It's much smaller. It's much more, you're still a founder of a podcast <laughs> in that sense, but it's actually very specific. And I think you couldn't, I think gather 50 folks who are podcasters in Singapore or in SF or in LA. Yeah, I mean, they, I don't think you get 50 people who all want to start up something <laughs> or want to scale it to be part of the program at the same time. Like, that's pretty hard to do, right? Does it make sense? Because then your subscale is a pool, right? You know, because your pool is so small. Yeah. You can't get that pool. But I think you, are, you can find 50 of those folks globally around the world who hit a certain bar, who really want to set up or scale this podcast, are ready to be part of the community right now. Um, like, you know, I think that's where, that's where the strength really lies in that very niche-ness of it. Um, of course, I don't know whether from a on-deck perspective, I don't know what I think about it from a revenue stream basis. I think because, you know, the larger programs like founders, etc., are much more obvious in that sense. Uh, but I think there's, some, there's a powerful of that, the niche-ness uh, for the consumer, which is the more niche you are, the better it is. Yeah. How many people are in the cohort, actually? I'm not sure. And like, is it, is it chaotic? I don't know. Actually. Is it chaotic? It is. Uh, Are people assigned yeah, mentors is, um, during your time? No. <laughs> yeah, no. I mean, it's kind of like very freshman, <laughs> like, freshman you, know, vibe. you know, first month kind of freshman vibes. It's like, oh, you get thrown in there and you're all part of Zoom and you're just like looking at each other's faces <laughs> and you're like, I hope this person's cool. And it's like, hey, Jeremy, describe yourself and your hobbies, you know? Like, you know? And then you think, you know, you circle the next person and then you're like, oh, this person's cool or this person's not cool. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so it was very, very freshman uh, vibes. Yeah. Um, well, I don't have any other questions. I, you know, do you have any maybe last things you want to say to anyone who's interested in applying to on, on deck or it's a couple of things, you know, to think about. I mean, I think firstly is like, I think the geography thing is really underrated, uh, which is that because they have evaporated geography, um, they've really made it much more flexible to everybody. Yeah. Um, I think so many programs have really been wedded. Like even like, it's like Harvard or Stanford, right? Like you have to travel <laughs> to Boston to be, go to yep. Harvard, right? You know I mean, which is great. I mean, obviously, uh, especially, you know, if you were, grew up in Boston <laughs> and it's pretty easy if you grew up in New York. It gets pretty difficult if you think about from SF, right? Uh, where it's hard to get access. And and then it feels impossible because they don't even know about Harvard, uh, you know, from, you know, somewhere in like Southeast Asia, like, you know, Cambodia, right? Like it just feels way too far away, both in terms of network, in terms of access, or even the thought of moving countries, right? So, you know, um, you know, I think there's a little bit of privilege that happens with that location dynamic, right? Which is it favors people who are you know, have high information access and high, uh, have the capability to move their life, right? And then, you know, chip in a student debt, you know, to access that geography, right? Um, whereas I think this is really, really levels the playing field for anybody who's a great person who wants to be a founder or a podcaster or ERB. And I think it is great for people in Menlo Park, you know, <laughs> who don't want to go to SF. Uh, it's great for people, like I said, you know, in Denver. It's great for people in, you know, Singapore or Hong Kong or London. And it's great for people in Cambodia or Papua New Guinea or New Zealand, right? You know, uh, and I think that is crazy, right? Because the, the value they can get is pretty much flat, right? Because you no longer, you build the whole program without geography. Obviously, I think 
the challenge, I think that, that I didn't get mentioned is I think time zones is a problem. Um, and I think that's a legacy piece of on deck being built out of San Francisco. So everything is really around, you know, PST hours, uh, specific standard time, um, which is, I think, really easy and doable if you're on the East Coast or in the States or even, you know, you're in, I guess, New Zealand. Uh, but I think it's a little bit harder for like, you know, people across the world in like Middle East or India or Asia, right? Um, because it's totally flipped. Uh, so I think, you know, that's where I think you have to be quite smart about, you know, be, doing asynchronous content. I think there's also, a, a, you know, I think I've been quite clear about recommendations to on deck, which is that, you know, really broadening out that set of socials and the, asyn the synchronized community events. And I think they've been doing a good job actually building up a bunch of events uh, that are just suitable um, suitable for the on deck um, community out in Asia uh, or different time zones. But also, I think it's good for other folks, right? Because some people are night owls or some people are, you know, morning people, right? So, yep. so actually, it works out for everybody, actually. <laughs> so, I think that's one piece about the international side. Um, of course, I think the community is a lot thinner in different geographies, right? So, you know, obviously, there's a high density in in the Bay Area and the East Coast. And then there's a lower density uh, in terms of community over different geographies. But I think that's something that will improve over time, right? Uh, similar to Stanford or Harvard, right? Where the alumni clubs are much stronger on the East Coast and West Coast, uh, but are weaker in different parts of the world. So that's that. Um, so that's the geography piece. I'm actually very curious about what to look for in the founder question. I don't know if you had any yeah you know you went you went through meeting so many different people yeah. like how did you decide like who is interesting yeah and was a good fit yeah you know you know i founded two companies and each time around you know there's a massive you know search process and the first one you know i co-founded with someone who at the time was a good friend who had been in the army with me and so i really trusted and respected him because he had you know, dug <laughs> trenches with me and we had, you know, helped each other through some really tough times. Yeah. You know, like, you know, you know, marching, <laughs> through the, you know, or navigating, marching, uh, you know, like dozens of kilometers um, in, you know, two or three a.m. or like navigating the jungle. Um, and, then, you know, <laughs> you know, I was, you know, carrying all the weight and, you know, he was, you know, helping out with the compass and direction. So, yeah. So it was a, interesting challenge uh but you know it was a very serendipitous easy one and then the second company was you know took more of a involved search process where you know i was dumped by mul multiple teammates and i also dumped you know other teammates as well right uh as part of the process so i think it's less about well we'll talk about two things i think one is what to look out for and i talk about the second part is really more about the process i think which is, I think, more important than what to look out for. Mm -hmm. I think what you're looking out for is, and kind of, it's kind of like the interview criteria of rubric, right? Mm -hmm. Which is that, number one, you want someone that you can really work with, right? Like, at the end of the day, you're just going to be spending so much time together for the next, you know, if you're successful, five to ten years, right? <laughs> you know, yeah. You know, right? And if you're unsuccessful, it's between you know, three months to three years and you got to make some really tough decisions along the way, right? So you really want to have someone that you can really have an honest discussion with uh, and really be able to trust and respect. So I think that's, that's really the fundamental crux of it because I think everyone talks about skills or like industry fit or coding ability or business ability. And I'm like, no, no, no. This, like number one, it's just like, can you just work with this person? And do you trust this person? Do you respect this person, right? Um, and because that's really the crux of it. Because if you can have all those things, you can figure out a ton of stuff. Uh, but if you don't have it, you can't solve anything, right? So one is really more fundamental than the other, right? Um, so I think that's really important is that trust and respect. Yeah, because you know you want to be in a space where if you have that conversation with a person, you feel like you can be honest about what's going on. Mm -hmm. And that you're going to get a professional, thoughtful answer mm -hmm. that you respect. And you also want to be in a position where the other person is honest about what's going on mm -hmm. and that you're able to give a professional, thoughtful answer as well, right? Um, and that's, you know, that's, 
you're not trying to look for a friend. I think that's uh, that's why I tell people there's lots of people that you you like, <laughs> but you may not necessarily trust and respect, right? You yeah. know, uh, you know. I, I think that's a very like you know freshman thing to discover, right? You know, there's lots of people you like, but you may not necessarily respect, and there's lots of people that you respect, but you don't necessarily like, right? Um, so I think that trust and respect is really more fundamental, and then. I think the liking piece, et cetera, that's something that you really build up over time, honestly. Mm -hmm. I think obviously then there's a whole stack around like founder market fit, right? Which is less about, I think both of you may be looking for product market fit, but it's really about founder market fit, which is do you fit the problem that you're tackling? Um, and does the other person help solve the problem, right? And so, you know, if you... You know, this is where the VCs kind of come in or your third party or your guidance from mentors comes in because they're going to look at the team and be like, hmm, like <laughs> both of you want to solve quantum computing, but neither of you have done anything quantum computing. <laughs> you know, that was like, this sounds like a weak team to us, right? You know, and it's pretty obvious when I say it out yeah. that way, which is, you know, if you trust and respect each other and maybe you can learn and figure out quantum computing. I, and I use that as an example, right? Um <laughs> Or, you know, you're both business folks, but you've never done quantum computing and now you want to do quantum computing. It's like kind of like, uh, doesn't logically kind of like, you know, sounds like you're going to do a lot of learning on the job. I'm not saying you can't succeed, but the odds do feel a bit stacked against you, right? Uh, versus like one person has done quantum computing and is an excellent engineer and the other person is a business person who has also done it, this dev for a quantum computing company. And it's like, yeah, it's pretty obvious. Like this is a much stronger team than the ones I just mentioned earlier, right? Uh, and then, you know, it's a bit of a sliding scale <laughs> between, right? Which is maybe the business person has done quantum computing and the engineer has not, right? Or vice versa, right? You know, so, you know, it's a bit of a spectrum dynamic. And I think just having that third person point of view really helps a lot. And then I think the last, is, and then so I think in terms of process, I think what you need to do is, I tell people is just like, one is, you know, stack the top of the, think about it as a funnel, right? <laughs> you know, sales funnel, marketing funnel, right? Just stack the top, right? Just meet everybody on deck, you know, old and new, anybody who is potentially relevant based on you going through the directory and searching for the keywords that you like. Of course, the prerequisite to that is that you know what markets and problems that you want to solve personally as well. So that's goes without saying. And the second one is go to all the community mixers and do a lot of serendipity, right? Because maybe your self-awareness is a bit off or maybe you'll be open to tackling other problems that, you know, you didn't realize that you actually enjoyed or thought about. And then in the middle of the final, it's like, you know, start doing a whole bunch of 30-minute calls, um, just like screen <laughs> people and just be like, you know, just, you know, create a, you know, maybe like a spreadsheet. The roles are the names and then the columns are like, you know, number one is like, do I trust and respect this person, right? <laughs> you know, like that's one, right? And then number two is like, do we want to work? Do we want to, um, you know, is there an overlap in what we want to solve, right? You know, really, right? The problem, right? <laughs> and then the category, actually, to be pretty honest, is like, uh, does this other person want me, right? <laughs> you know, because a lot of people, you know, don't like you and then they just never follow up. Or they, you know, And then, so you respect them, but they don't want to work with you. I think you should just be aware of that because they, they know that about you too, right? You may not, they may like you, but you may not like them, right? So, you know, just kind of like go through that list, you know, and just have that, you know, mini CRM. And then the next stage after that is start working on the problems like brainstorming, jamming, you know, virtual brainstorming. So and just to figure out what the problem is, this is the ideation phase. And I think this part is like, I think a lot of people ideate too, what's it called, um, slowly. So, you know, it's just you know, once a week or whatever it is, one hour, once a week. It's just too slow. I think it's more like more hours, but, you know, shorter, you know, time period. And then people try to like sequentialize it, which is like, okay, I want to work with one person first and then I reject this person and then I'm going to do the next person, which is very monogamous. Uh, and very, uh, I think, probably more socially acceptable in, you know, dating, for example. Uh, but in this founder side, you know, because you're in a rush and you're hurry, like, I really try to encourage people to be more, uh, you know, open to simultaneously, tra you know, parallel tracking everybody. Because, you know, it's like a freshman period, right? It's trying to meet as many people and brainstorm for two hours with lots of the people who have made it past a half an hour, like 10 or, you know, 20 people, you know, a couple of hours each, just... Because you're just trying to like be efficient, right? And you can compare and you're going to end up A-B testing, right? Which is like, oh, actually, I thought this person was awesome. But then after I 
did a two-hour session, I realized that this person uh, is great for 30 minutes, but isn't great for 22 hours, right? Yeah. <laughs> or this person doesn't show up on time, or, you know, it, there's a bunch of stuff that shows up. And I think it, it's really important to really start knocking out people at the stage, right? It's like, this person wasn't... And, you know, the truth of the matter is, I think people get a little bit worried because they're like, oh, you know, if I knock off people that I don't like, it means that I'm not going to become a founder because I can't find yeah. a founder. And I'm like, no, 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 like, like, you got to work with this person for five to seven years, right? You know, like, like if you can't even work with them for two hours and you run away with someone else, you're never going to stop feeling that because there's going to be a ton of people. You know what I mean, you're never going to stop feeling it. So just go through that process. And then, you know, at some point in time after you get to that stage, you know, you'll probably winnow it down to a couple of folks. You probably want to start um, doing, I think, uh, first round review uh, by First Round Capital has a great, like, dating questionnaire which is about like you know 20 to 50 questions so kind of like go through one-on-one and go through that process it's very deep uh it's kind of like the 20 questions to make you fall in love kind of thing uh but you know it's just ask some deep questions like timeline commitment decisions who is going to be what so so forth and it's a tough set of, and it actually takes a lot of time honestly to go through that process so i wouldn't do it too early i think a lot of people try to do it too early because they want to do that but it's not that efficient in terms of screening, um, but I think it's pretty efficient once you kind of like do a, start circling around the problem. It's nice to carve out and it's going to be a, a couple of hours at least to go through that thing. I probably would break it out into two or three sessions yeah. rather than kind of like do it in one go, which is way too long, uh, especially remotely. Probably two sessions, you know. Um, and I think and then at some point you start narrowing to one or two teams I think part of the process that's pretty tough is like trying to say no to people is pretty tough. A lot of people like, you know, people who want to work with you, but you don't want to work with them is pretty straightforward, <laughs> you know, uh, because it's just like, oh, I'm rather not. Uh, that's very straightforward to do, but you should just do it and just keep the door open, of course, you know, by saying like maybe things change, but it's just a polite thing to do at minimum. And of course, things may change, right? Maybe your preferences change in five years, for example. And then I think the second aspect about it is just like, I think there's a bunch of people that you started working with and is this not a good fit because of trust and respect or because you don't really like them or because at the end of the day or you can't figure out what the thing is. And you just got to just call spade and spade. Just let them know, hey, you know, like, I don't think this is the right fit. Uh, I think you're great and, you know, just not what it is, right? And I think that's worth a quick call just to let them know. And then I think the trickiest part is that last group of people, the final two or three groups that you're kind of like part of. That's always the trickiest because you've spent a lot of time instead of doing the questions, et cetera. And I think that's where you just need to have that, you know, honest conversation say like, and I think the good thing about this group, hopefully, is that everyone's a little bit more mature. Everyone wants to be a founder. And the truth is those folks are also like dating other people at the same time. Right? <laughs> so, so I think you feel pretty bad, like letting them go and down, but they're probably thinking themselves too, right? You know, like, like, oh, there's these other folks I could potentially be with, right? So I will just be mindful about that. Um... I did a couple more things quite quickly. It's just like, I think they call it, you know, I think there's a lot of teams that are going to be a situation where, where are you homogenous and where are you heterogeneous as a team, right? And what I mean by that is, at the end of the day, like attracts like. Um, the truth is, I'm always going to, personally, I'm always going to enjoy hanging out with people who are former consultants, who have been experienced founders and grew up in Southeast Asia, and, you know, got educated in the States and likes improv. Like, I'm always going to, like, really like this person, right? Because this person is very similar to me, right? And I think what's interesting about it is just, like, I don't... A lot of people end up, and I see a lot of these teams who come up to me, is like, they end up being very similar. And then it shows up in different ways. Like, we both want to be CEO. Or, you know, or we both want to be CTO. Or, you know, because they're so homogenous, they want to be the same thing. They have too much overlap in their skills, Right. Um, and so I think that's actually a problematic because then people are like homogenous in skills, but heterogeneous in, in, in aspiration, right? This is very much like, you know, dating and marriage, right? Which is, you don't need to be homogenous in terms of your background, but you do need to be homogenous in your values, right? In, in order for the marriage to work, right? As a predictor of stability, right? But you don't need to be homogenous in profession, versus a lot of people are homogenous in profession, but actually later on realized that actually, actually even though the profession is a signifier for certain values, is actually their values are heterogeneous, right? So anyway, I think you just want to be kind of like be thoughtful about that, which is 
uh, you know, like if you kind of agree on a roles, look, someone's going to be CEO and someone's got to be CTO or equivalent or someone's going to be, you know, COO or third person. You know what I mean? Like that role conversation should be straightforward. And if it's too difficult, it may not be the right fit. It just means that like it or not, maybe you love the idea together. You both love the idea. Maybe you both love the solution you created together. But when you kind of agree on a role, actually what's showing is that you don't have the same understanding of your personal trajectory within that startup. <laughs> and that's okay. Like sometimes you can get a bit heated. Yeah. It's like, I want to be CEO. And other person's like, I want to be CEO. And then you're like, people get like very, like, you know, like fight each other. And they're like, oh, you're stealing my idea and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, whoa, like, is this an idea? You're so early. Like, why are we even, why are you even debating this issue at all? You both can try and set up the startup, but both of you have a vision of the startup and this idea with yourself mm -hmm. as CEO, and it's not, it's not compatible, full stop. So just stop fighting and just go your separate ways. You know, it's more mature and it's more professional, right? But I think you really see a lot of that. I mean, if you can't make it work, just walk away. Don't, don't get emotionally invested and just be like, I need to make this work. I need to make this founder work. I need to make this partnership work. I need a co-founder in order to build a startup. No, no, no. It's the other way around. Like, what problem do you really love to solve? And what is the best approach and that you can think of right now? And how are you going to have iterate with the process to make it better and better over time? And you and how do I get customers to pay for it? And how do and then how do I keep pushing that flywheel over and over again? And you're gonna do that by yourself until somebody joins you, or you can keep doing it until an employee joins you <laughs> or you can keep doing it and a founder joins you right does it make sense you know like yeah so like one is really the the meat of the the startup and something else is just the the, the form or structure of it yeah when founders split what happens to the work that was done <laughs> yeah that's a tough one um every experienced founder will hear that story and say to themselves nothing has been done in the grand scheme of things. Like this brilliant idea, this brilliant <laughs> solution means nothing. You know, I have a list of ideas on my notepad, you know, 30 ideas long. And, you know, I sometimes help founders as well because other founders come up to me and they know that I have this idea or whatever it is and I just brainstorm with them. And of course, sometimes I feel a bit possessive. I'm like, oh, I helped you figure out this set of the idea, blah, blah. Because, you know, it's natural. Right? It's like, oh, I'm so smart and I help you, blah, blah. But... The moment you take a moment out, you're like, no, like this person is, you just gave an idea or you just was shooting the breeze of this person, but you added no value, right? You didn't actually build something or even if you do some really basic code or, you know, like even help with the first customers, like even so it's still such a drop in the ocean versus the whole um, arc of what the startup needs to be built. Yeah. So I really wouldn't worry too much about it from a rational perspective. I think where it gets tricky, of course, is that may be true at a rational basis, but may be unclear from a personal relationship basis. Because people may feel like, oh, I put a lot of time in it. Or, you know, not everybody is a seasoned second time founder. Like every time I work with a second or third time founders, we were just kind of like, yeah, we just upfront was just like, look, if we don't work out, we don't work out. We just both get a copy of this and we can choose to work on it or not, right? You know, that's it, right? Like, it's a very straightforward conversation. Like, literally look at each other, we shake hands. We don't shake hands, we just like, no, and we're like, yeah, like, like our whiteboard is not dr uh, dramatic innovation that's going to change yeah. the, the world, right? You know, like, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, actually ac doing it and executing it is really the thing. So, but I think first-time founders may struggle with that. So, I think it's really about saying that up front. Um, and I think that's where the dating questionnaire is helpful. Um, that they have is basically saying like, hey, what happens if one of us leaves, right? Um, that's a good conversation to have. Um, not necessarily like like date one, right? <laughs> you know, or date two, but maybe around date five to date 10, around there, that's really a good conversation to have, which is as we continue to ideate this, like if we both choose not to work out, like what will we do? And you know, it's standard like planning in case, and you know, it's not, a lot of people feel like, oh, it's very pessimistic. Are you saying that we won't, are not gonna work out if we say that, blah, blah, blah. And the truth is, it's not. It's just, this is a useful way to have a conversation about a common contingency where lots of founders leave all the time. And the reason why we're having this difficult conversation is not necessarily to get the best answer, but to get a better sense of who we each other 
is by having this conversation. And I think that's the crux of it. Is a lot of people ha- are like avoid tough questions because they don't see the value or they're worried about it's too tough to get answer, blah, blah, blah. But no, no, you do, you tackle tough questions because you want to see who the other person is and how that person is relative to you. If you can't solve a difficult question, like what happens if one of us leaves? Yeah. There's no way we can solve that tougher problem of how do we fundraise or how do we terminate this employee? You know what I mean? So this is actually, our tough questions are a gift. They gift you the ability to see whether you will be a good team. I think from a, from a third person point of view, and I think from a first person point of view, when you receive a tough question, I think you just think to yourself, hey, how do I do this process in a way that builds a relationship? And that's what everybody kind of organically does, but it's hard to remember sometimes. Uh, and so I think that holds true for a lot of negotiations. A lot of people negotiate really hard because they, they go in and they're like, oh, I'm negotiating equity. I'm negotiating roles. I'm negotiating A or B or C. And then they kind of forget that at this stage, because it's nothing or very early, if they negotiate too hard, they destroy the relationship. That makes sense. So building the relationship is more important than the negotiation because so much value has yet to be created, which is of course very different. Of course, you know, if I was like doing big biz dev for Sony, then, you know, it's, <laughs> there's no relationship to be built with just competitors or frenemies. Yeah. So it's just about cutting the, the slice of pie, right? Um, yeah. Well, thank you so much. I think that actually answered pretty much, I think, all of the questions, I believe. And so was, this is a great conversation. I feel like I learned so much in the last hour and 15 minutes. Um, definitely have a lot to think about um, before I, you know, make any kind of decision. But, you know, this is all very, very, very um, thoughtful and helpful, I think, even to, you know, anyone who ends up listening to this as well. So I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Katie. You know, it's a, you know, I think two quick thoughts just to throw out there before we wrap this up as well. It's like, I think one thing you mentioned earlier was to talk about price, right? And I think price is much easier once you know that <laughs> you're doing yeah. the program part-time <laughs> on the weekends. Uh, because, you know, then you're doing a normal job and then so and you're not, not eating you know, cost. <laughs> dumping a ton of cash off your savings and then uh, either the cost, right? So I think that's really a much better way about thinking about it is that I think the cost is much more reasonable once you think about it from a part-time uh, basis. Um, and I really encourage most people to think about it that way and say, hey, I know traditionally school has been full-time, <laughs> but hey, you know, welcome to you know, 2021 <laughs> 20, in our case, <laughs> you know, uh, where we have the internet. Yeah, we can study part-time, right? You know, uh, part-time degrees are awesome and, you know, the online courses. So why not do things, you know, part-time? Uh, so I think the cost really dramatically changes when it happens because now you have income, right? And I think the second thing I do think about a little bit is, you know, just like any good college or any good, like, you know, community, right? If you think about it, like, there's a very utilitarian aspect about, and you said something interesting, which is, did I join this thing in order to have a demo day to have build a startup? But hopefully, I think also, if you join a community and it's a high value one, which is not true for every community, <laughs> But, you know, hopefully, you know, the, the value of it stacks up over time, right? So it's not, you know, a couple of grand for a couple of months program, but hopefully it's a couple of grand plus a membership <laughs> uh, for, um, you know, like, a, you know, uh, an interest rate multiplier, right? You know, just kind of like, you know, a small thing that you adds value over the years, you know, on a recurring basis that compounds interest over time. Um, and I think that's a more interesting way to think about it because, you know, when I look at my, you know, I look at my Harvard MBA, right. You know, I'm just like, yeah, you know, like I learned quite a bit in those two years. Don't get me wrong. My professors work really hard to <laughs> teach me stuff and some of it managed to get through. But if you ask me right now, like, can I remember, um, you know, X case or what I learned from that thing? I'd be like, uh, it's kind of like a bit fuzzy right now. And probably in 10 years, it's probably going to be even worse, right. You know, my memory about what exactly I learned there. Um, but of course it was a nice kickstart, but I think the community part kind of like really compounds over time. Right. Uh, because through that, I got to meet Ching Ching, which I'd never got to meet before. Uh, yeah, which is awesome. You know, I got to do something awesome, like create a children's book with her. Right. Uh, you know, adapting lean in by Sheryl Sandberg for, you know, parents and, you know, uh, and kids to learn and read together. Uh, and if we stay in touch since then, and then now I got to meet you. Right. <laughs> you know, so 
So it's kind of awesome, right? You know, like, you know, I did a half MBA and I don't think going into half MBA, I was like, I'm going to pay a quarter million dollars <laughs> to move to this godforsaken city called Boston, where we just had the snow apocalypse, uh, <laughs> which is way too cold for me because I want to meet Katie, right? In like, you know, six years, right? <laughs> yeah, you know, like, like that's probably, you know, and, you know, I don't think I put it by pros. There's like learn, community, and then sub, sub, sub point KD, right? You know what I mean? But now I got to meet you, right? You know? Uh, and now we've managed to create a fun podcast together that will help other people evaluating on deck and evaluate other ways of becoming a founder as well, right? And I think that's awesome, right? Yeah, you'll never know where you'll, you know, end up going or who you're going to meet or, you know, what opportunities, you know, are going to come across your path. And so. Exactly. Yeah, so think about it, like, you know, the reason why we're chatting is because we are part of two communities, right? So I'm part of the Harvard community, which let me meet Ching Ching, uh, and therefore, you know, you're her cousin. But <laughs> the second thing is that the under community, because of what is pulling, is pulling a certain type of affiliation, is pulling you, and therefore you and I, because we intersect on these two communities, get a meet, right? And we're in different cities, uh, you know, yeah. uh, across the world, <laughs> different time zones. It's nighttime for you. It's, yep. you know, the, you know, uh, you know, afternoon for me, you know, um, different stages to some extent, right? Because I'm a, I assume, you know, I'm probably a little bit further down my career, but you know, who knows, you know, what you and I will create it or help each other with in 10 years, right? Yeah. You know? Never know. Yeah. It's yeah. really good. Awesome. So just think about, you know, if you choose to go to Harvard or Stanford or on deck, whatever it is, you know, you know, you're going to be in my role and, but, you know, imagine having multiple of those relationships and then compounding them over time. Right. Um, and that's really hard to quantify, super hard to quantify, which, you know, which is why my parents kept telling me to go to college. Right. And I was like, <laughs> why do I need to go to college? I'm, I can study everything online. Right. You know? And then I was like, Oh wait, it's my friends. You know? <laughs> everybody. Right. Anyway. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I, I think I, so, but unfortunately, my parents weren't very good communicators. Uh, they were very much like, go to college, <laughs> you know, because rather than, you know, like, here's a one hour podcast about, you know, how it exactly helps you with all these metaphors and things like that, right? Yeah. 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 Well, thank you so much. I hope you have a great day. Um, I'm probably going to go to sleep now because it's nighttime here. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, thank you so much. All right, I'll talk to you later. Thank you for listening to Brave. If you enjoyed this podcast, please share this episode with friends and colleagues. Sign up at www.jeremyow.com to discuss this episode with other community members in our forum. Stay well and stay brave. <laughs>